This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Moshe Hoffman and Erez Ueli. Um, Moshe is uh, at the Max Planck Institute doing, well, evolutionary biology, I think, is the, is the focus at the Max Planck Institute, but also at MIT Sloan School and a little bit at Harvard. Um, and Erez is uh, at MIT Sloan School, also a little bit at Harvard. Um, and you're both the authors of this book here called Hidden Games, The Surprising Power of Game Theory to Explain Irrational Human Behavior. Now, I have to say, you know, this book kind of uh, checks all the boxes with me. You know, I teach game theory. I teach uh, behavioral economics. I've, I've taught evolutionary <laughs> biology. And, and so, you know, you guys really are kind of straddling a whole bunch of, of, of disciplines and, of course, I want to talk about kind of how you think about interdisciplinary research in, in today's uh, world. But, you know, the book is really about how you can apply um, don't, kind of theoretical frameworks um, from game theory to, to things beyond the, the kind of standard behaviors, standard activities, right, like economics and, I mean, sort of you know, financially motivated um, activities or maybe, you know, explicitly activities around reproduction. I mean, it's all about um, symbols. It's about speech. It's about social norms. Um, and, and I think that what you're trying to do is, is show how all of these things that humans do in our, uh, what we might think of as culture, you know, have a hidden logic. And, and the logic... Uh, takes us back to kind of underlying motivations, which would be more familiar to those of us in, in biology and economics. Um, so, you know, how did you guys um, come to, to see the interconnectedness of all these different disciplines? This one's for you. Okay. Um, well, I, both Eris and I have a, a pretty strong econ background. We both got our uh, uh, PhDs at, at University of Chicago. I also did my undergrad there. And um, he, um, so strong background in classic, you know, thinking through incentives using game theory. And I, I guess what you alluded to that's different, one step of what's different is, you know, in, in the classical models, we're thinking about people consciously, rationally deliberating through yeah. what's, what's optimal. And, you know, since then, there's been kind of uh, also a tradition of using game theory in, in biology. And, and so I learned about that from, you know, reading Richard Dawkins in, in high school, um, uh, The Selfish Gene. So, so he kind of argues that you can use, you know, he summarizes work from like uh, Maynard Smith and Fisher and, and mm -hmm. Trivers that says, look, you can use repeated prisoner's dilemma to understand how, you know, why bats share blood. You can use the hawk dove model to understand animal territoriality. You can use, you know, Spence and costly signaling to understand long tails and birds and, and uh, uh, chirping to, for baby birds to get fed. Um, and, and so, so there was also this tradition in biology to, to apply game theory. And there, the optimization isn't through conscious, strategic, deliberative thought. It, mm. It's through natural selection. That, that's what's optimizing. And like you alluded to there, what's, what's being optimized isn't, um, uh, you know, happiness or, or wealth. It's, it's just fitness. Um, and so, so we're kind of trying to build on that tradition, um, but also uh, recognizing that in humans, um, there's another optimization process that's, that's fairly unique. And this is building on the tradition which, which we've also been ex exposed to, you know, through our colleagues at Harvard, like, like Joe Henrik and, and Rob Board, who's at a ASU, who study cultural evolution. And then there's also other people who study, you know, learning processes, um, uh, like in the cognitive science literature and, you know, things like reinforcement learning. Um, and, and so uh, those processes also optimize. Um, and uh, it's not evolution it's it's you know things like learning um and what's being optimized there is, is also slightly different it's it's things that were kind of genetically encoded to count as rewards like like access to, to mates or uh, um legacies and prestige and those things bias our learning processes in the same way that that reproductive success biases evolutionary processes um and you know by by then 
looking at, okay, what kind of preferences and beliefs do we learn through these processes? Um, you can gain a lot of insight um, onto, onto weird aspects of our preferences and beliefs, especially now once you, once you add in the fact that optimization in social settings, you know, you can use tools from game theory and insights from game theory. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of combining those different ideas. This learning process is what it optimizes with insights from game theory and, you know, following in, uh, in those different traditions, we, we can explain all sorts of puzzles of human social behavior. Yeah, I mean, in terms of social behavior, I mean, you're really trying to, you know, back out the underlying logic of the things that we normally think of as, you know, purely cultural, right? You know, sort of the passion and aesthetics, you know, altruism, symbols. Um, and, um, and, and so, I mean, you guys don't really make this nature culture distinction, do you? Not really. Um, you know, you could have nature doing the optimization via biological evolution. You could have culture doing it via some sort of social learning or, or reinforcement learning at the individual level. The key thing is that, that we need is for optimization to be going on. And as long as it is, and, um, and we kind of understand how it's going on to some extent, mm -hmm. so that we're not applying it in some crazy way to, to the wrong thing, then I think we're fine. We make these three... Uh distinctions in the book, um, all of which resonated with me, right? There's the distinction between <clears throat> primary and secondary rewards, right? Um, between proximate and ultimate uh, kind of motivations. And then, of course, this emic, etic uh, view of things. And it's that last one, I think, that, um, you know, really resonated because it's, it's, it's it, you know, we normally, I mean, I think in game theory, we're always talking about the first two. The third is one that we kind of do, but we don't do it explicitly, right? We, we flip back and forth in our lives between uh, kind of the inside view and, and the outside view. So, you know, as you walk through your daily life, right? I mean, uh, do you take this anthropological view of, of, of everything that, that you do, right? As you're, as you're walking down the street, do you, do you, you know, examine your behavior vis-a-vis -vis your colleagues and vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the merchants that you engage with, you know, through this anthropological lens? Do you, do you ever, do you ever like shut it off and, and just, and just, and just live? I mean, we both sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know how it is, like as soon as you become an economist, you're always viewing the world through this lens of incentives and equilibria. And this just opens up an avenue towards seeing the role of incentives and equilibria in an additional space that historically maybe you wouldn't have done that as much. But it's just it's just expanding that a little bit. So, yeah, I, I think it's very hard to turn it off. You're, you're kind of simultaneously living. You kind of simultaneously have your own emic explanations that you give for your behavior. You have your own proximate mm -hmm. feelings that you feel. And then, you know, you're also able to analyze that to some extent in, in yourself and in others and probably better in others than in yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, do you do you I mean, you know, do you does that change the nature of how you engage in symbolic behavior? I mean, do you do less less of it, more of it, right? Are you more sort of strategic in in your use of say um, symbolic behavior, um, group identification behavior, and so forth, status signaling? What's your answer? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think I think it makes us a little bit more self aware and and maybe more prone to notice our own hypocrisy. So. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we're both willing to call each other out, and, and I think um, maybe are a uh, little bit less uh, less prone to uh, I don't know. At least myself, I, I I'm less prone to kind of argue highfalutin mm -hmm. principles or uh, um, uh, uh, do other things that that I might kind of recognize. Okay, there's probably a more selfish motive going on at play there. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't need to lie about it. Um, uh, and uh, maybe I'm a little bit more self-aware as, as a result. Um, yeah, specifically when it comes to like certain ideologies I might have held when I was younger, uh, you know, mm -hmm. political ideologies. Maybe I was like more pro-Israel or, you know, I was like, you know, uh, free market libertarian or things like that. And now I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> where'd that come from? <laughs> so, so just to give you the, oh, sorry. To give you, to give you an example, you know, we were talking about the World Cup uh, last night, and you know, <laughs> right. 
Uh, um, and so, uh, you know, Eris was mentioning that, okay, he, he was uh, really rooting for Messi. Um, but he, he made sure to caveat when he said that, like, okay, I kind of know I'm only rooting for him because there's a sense that, like, it's somewhat deserved and it, it feels like he ought to win. But I, I know, like, what does that even mean, ought to? And, like, in what sense does he deserve it? Like, that's kind of weird. And so he's kind of realizing, okay, at approximate level, I support him, but I also kind of realize, like, there's something weird going on here. And, and mm -hmm. you know, he's calling himself out while he does it. And, you know, it's, it's yeah. Well, in particular, I mean, in terms of aesthetics, right? So, you know, you have a whole section where you talk about, you know, um, aesthetic taste as um, a costly signal, yeah, right? Here, and here it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it made me, it made me, you know, it made me, I was like, wait, this is going to ruin my appreciation of fine wine if, if, uh, if you know, I remember I had a, um, I had an ex-girlfriend who told me that the only reason why I liked fine wine was to, you know, as a, as a because as a, you know, status signal or whatever. And, and I was like, wait, I, I drink, I drink my nice wine when I'm all by myself, you know, I'm doing some takeout Chinese food, I'll, food, I'll open up a nice bottle of, of, of Burgundy. Um, but you know, it's, it's, even if no one's around, right. I mean, you know, should I, should I, is, is your enjoyment of a good wine ruined by your realization that this is, uh, something that, you know, probably serves some social signaling status, um, you know, purpose. I was only kind of kidding when I said it's the other way around. I mean, what ends up happening to me is that like I'll look into um, like a, a new. There's a new puzzle that we're looking into. You know, maybe it's mm -hmm. like why do people um, fall into certain rabbit holes where they start to like obsess over something that seems kind of related to something we would care about, but then yeah. it kind of goes off on its own tangent. And, and, and the example that I have in mind here is. Um, there's a whole subculture of denim fanatics that yeah. what they like is very high-end denim that was made using older machines and as a consequence is like, you know, tougher and better quality like the, like the denim used to be. But then the thing that they particularly prize is the way the denim fades. And in order to get the denim to fade properly, they do things like they never wash it. They buy it with too much ink on it and then get ink all over everything. Once it does need to be washed, they put it into the freezer because you're not supposed to wash it if you want to get really stark fades. And, you know, clearly they're doing this crazy stuff. And, you know, I started looking into this because it was a puzzling behavior that we wanted to be able to understand. And next thing I knew, I was buying fancy Japanese jeans. And so I kind of fell for it in the other way direction. And I think I think that's often the way it goes with aesthetics. It's kind of the opposite of ideologies is is I for me, at least I look into it and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool stuff. Wait, I, I want one of those. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like appreciating, um, I don't know, athletic performance, right? I mean, yes, of course, right? Being a good athlete is in many ways a status signal it, it probably has you know positive results in the, in the mating game but it doesn't make it any less you know amazing and, and beautiful to observe right yeah and if anything sometimes it makes you appreciate it better i think like anyone mm -hmm. who looks at my jeans will just see jeans like, they're not really they don't see anything special about them and so the fact that you've bothered to try to understand what's going on in the subculture suddenly does make you appreciate yeah. it to some extent but it does also at the same time make you realize how ridiculous you are. Like the two of us make fun of each other for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there, I mean, there's something weird about these types of, of status goods, which is like half of the game is to be able to pay for it, but the other half is to be able to talk about it in an intelligent yeah. way. And so, but by, by doing the research, Ares is Ares is getting you know that costly signal is now cheaper for him. Um, and, and so, so maybe that's part of why he's internalized that is cool is because well, it's not so costly now that he has all this information to to share about it, which is. Yeah, half the signal. Well, what I like to, uh, one of the interesting points that you're making is that, you know, as, um, as these um, skills or aesthetic um, sets of knowledge become more complex, then there's sort of a pushback, right, where people try to emphasize subtlety. And it made me think of, you know, there's this term sprezzatura that Castiglione talks about a lot, right, which is, you know, you, you want to you want to work really hard, but you you don't want anybody to, to see you sweat, so to speak, right? That's right. Spezzatura, uh, I think, translates roughly to the um, the uh, ability to look effortless, um, you know, trying hard to look effortless, or something like that. And, and right. yeah, there there is a there is definitely an element of spezzatura in our uh, fashion, and one uh, could wonder. And it, and I think it's it's part of a more general phenomenon of looking effortless. Um, in in art uh, more broadly or in aesthetics more broadly and i think one could try to understand where does that come from 
Well, you use the ter- you talk about uh, was it shibui? Is that right? That's the right. Japanese term. That's right. So, which, which seems closely related to me. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, you know, you talk a lot about um, motivated reasoning. So I've, I've had a lot of podcasts where we talk about motivated reasoning. And, and I think that the, the sort of conventional view is that people engage in motivated reasoning in order to, you know, feel good, right? Now, of course, this, this is, if anything, it's, it's approximate cause, right? So it doesn't really, that doesn't really provide any, pos- any explanation for why people engage in, in motivated reasoning. So um, can you tell us a bit about, you know, what, what you, your approach to motivated reasoning and, and how it, it differs? I mean, it reminded me a lot of um, uh, a lot of the, the work of um, uh, Dan Sperber and uh, um, what's his name, the French guy? Hugo Mercier. Hugo Mercier, right? It reminded me a lot of their, their work, um, but, but you add a bit of a spin to it. Yeah, so, so the way that, that um, we explain motivated reasoning is we first talk about um, uh, just just looking at conscious strategic behavior. Um, what's the optimal kind of information that you want to collect and convey if you're trying to persuade someone else? And so we, we present a standard model of that, which, um, you know, we, we talk about it in terms of uh, evidence games, which, which for, you know, your, your audience familiar with game theory models, they're just kind of verifiable signals where you can verify when you have the signal, but not when you don't. Um, and so if, if you imagine, I don't know, the, uh, should, how technical I can, how technical do you want me to get for your audience? So, Go for it. All right. So, you know, there's two states of the world, maybe one where I'm smarter and more attractive and I'm trying to get you to go on a date with me or to hire me for a job or something. Okay. Um, And uh, um, so I want you to believe that the state is one. Um, So that's, you know, a standard persuasion context. My my, my utility is increasing in in your beliefs that the state is one. Okay. And now now I, um, you know, let's say I get a, a, a signal that's, you know, either zero or one and no, maybe it's more likely to be a one in, 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 in the state where it's one. Okay, so, so this, is, this is evidence that would support the state being one. Um, uh, now, I could verify that I have this evidence, okay? Um, uh, then, I, then I'll just, you know, show it to you. And that's obviously the optimal thing to do when I have it. Now, uh, uh, what if the evidence is, is bad? So when I have it, um, uh, you know, it actually decreases your odds, uh, your posteriors that the state is one. Okay, Th- then in that case, I wouldn't want to show it to you, and uh, um, uh, I'd like to prove to you that that uh, I don't have it when I don't. But there's no way to do that. I can only verify when I, when when I have the signal, not when I don't. Okay, so that's that's a standard model of of how evidence works. It's verifiable when you have it, not when you don't. When the when the evidence increases your beliefs in the direction I want it to go, I, I reveal it. Otherwise, I withhold it. Okay, so standard game theory analysis. You'll fully anticipate that. If I don't show you the the uh, evidence, if it's positive, then, then you assume I don't have it. If it's negative, then you'll assume nothing because, you know, in equilibrium, I wouldn't show it to you anyways. Okay, mm-hmm. fine. So everybody's fully Bayesian. Everybody's acting completely optimally, but I'm still uh, revealing evidence in a very biased way. I'm only showing you the, the good stuff. Okay. Um, so, so that's classic model. That's a one model that we present that, that explains, you know, one feature of spin. You only show the good stuff in equilibria. The other side knows that that's all you're going to show, show, and they interpret it accordingly. Fine. But wait, but wait, you say sometimes they, that we don't discount it though, right? Like we don't do an appropriate discount. We don't, we don't, we're not sufficiently skeptical oftentimes when we encounter spin, right? Yeah. So, so I, I think that, that that's right. And that, that's, uh, you you can ask why that why that happens, and I guess two possible answers. One is, um, you know, it takes some cognitive resources and effort and uh, and motivation for you you to adjust. And maybe if you're sufficiently motivated and you know have the time, and and the you know you're not under cognitive load, you'll you'll do better. But there still might you, you know a bias still might persist. There's you know uh, bounded rationality type constraints. Um, but sometimes you might also, you know, uh, one, one ingredient for that is you need to be motivated and sometimes you're not motivated to, to get it right. You're, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're on the same team as me and you, you're also trying to spin. So, you know, if you're watching Fox News and I'm, I'm saying very biased things to you, well then, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, you're also looking to collect biased evidence to tell you to your mm-hmm. friends. Um, right. so, so. That's another reason why you might might not be properly adjusting. You don't yeah, yeah. So you're not you're not you're not viewing Fox News, let's say, as a provider of information. You're using you're you're seeing it as a provider of Talking of points. you know 
of yeah of of ammunition yeah that's right that's right yeah and so so any other that's that's what we would argue is is going on in the receiver side and also the sender side if the sender is being consciously deliberatively strategic you know if i'm in, you know uh okay but then then to get to motivated reasoning we we add one more step to the mix and by the way this is kind of one model of one feature of spin and it'll end up you know once i add this next ingredient it'll set, explain one part of motivated reasoning in our book we kind of have three similar models that that cover three similar features of spin. But okay, so so how do we then explain motivated reasoning? Well, you know, one way you could uh, think about it then is also uh, now I've, you know, I'm only presenting you the supportive evidence and, and not the, 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 the non-supportive evidence. Uh, um, uh, okay, but then me myself, um, am I going to properly adjust for all of the biased evidence that, that I myself uh, am presenting? Um, you know, if I, if I, you know, tell you actually, you know, this is all I'm, I'm showing, I know I could, I put in a lot of effort to now adjust for it in my own beliefs so that then when you're not around, you know, in a private decision, I do things optimally, but that, that again, that's going to take effort on my part to adjust. That's, that's going to take motivation for, for me to adjust. And, you know, the, the default is to kind of anchor on the lies that I'm telling you and, and the bias mm -hmm. information that I'm telling you. And so, so there's good reason to think that, that what I'm motivated to tell you is also going to end up affecting my own beliefs, um, uh, again, because of things like bounded rationality. And now is, it, is this just the Trivers story where, you know, you, uh, are you know, a better, you're a better liar if you lie to yourself? Yeah, I think that that's part of it. And, and that was maybe going to be the, the option that, that I mentioned next, but, I, so, so what, one one argument that you can say is okay uh, if you can somehow see what I truly deep down believe that can create an incentive for my true deep down mm -hmm. beliefs to also stay biased. But I think uh, I'm not even sure you need that in that you know a standard you know cognitive effort story you know where where we amortize we, we kind of save the data of what I told you and, and not all of the full information that we got mm -hmm. to that data and we anchor and adjust and you know standard bounded rational rationality stories could also get you there. So, so I think, yeah, both those mechanisms are reasonable ways by which we internalize. And, and we talk a lot about internalization, how, how yeah. the strategic incentives get built into our own beliefs and preferences. Those are two mechanisms by which our, our motivation to spin can also end up being internalized and uh, into motivated beliefs that we, we, we hold ourselves. And so, so I think, so economists, uh, I think tend to think that the, we, separate out our understanding of the world and then our strategic behavior, right? So, you know, we always think that a better, more accurate understanding of the world is going to, to help us, right? Um, and so, you know, you go get that better understanding of the world and then you decide, okay, now do I tell the truth or do I lie or, you know, how do I, how do I interact with others? And, and I think, you know, what you're saying is that, well, you know, a better understanding of the world, a more accurate understanding of the world isn't necessarily going to, to help you in your strategic interactions in, in all cases. And, and, and in those cases, we wouldn't expect to see somebody pursuing a more accurate version of the world. And, and so, you know, you're not going to spin when, it, when you're not going to engage in, in motivated reasoning when you're, you know, you're just trying to like, say, I don't know, open a, open a door with a key, right? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're going to actually try to figure out, right, what works and what, what doesn't work if you're, I guess, engaging the, the physical world, right? Exactly. Like you, you don't have motivated reasoning about whether the stove is hot. Yeah. Right. Um, now, look, a lot of a lot of what you're, you're a lot of your I think the the core model that you um, that you spend a lot of time on are these uh, state signal structures. Um, could, could you talk a bit about that? Um, and 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 these, I mean, as game theorists, it's very it's I think a lot of our models are, are binary, right? You know, you're either a good or a bad person, you know, you're either trustworthy or untrustworthy, you know, um, but, you know, the, the real world is, is full of, of continuities. I mean, you know, if you're not a game theorist, then, you know, the entire world for you as an economist is, is a world of, of, of continuity. Could, could you talk a bit about how do these specific models, um, how do you get them to do so much work? Um, so, so I, the models that you're referring to, I guess, 
we're, we're trying to highlight kind of the essential role that, that coordination plays. Um, mm-hmm. And many, many situations involve coordination. So norm enforcement involves coordination. You, you only want to kind of punish norm violators if you, you expect others to, to agree with you that, that they violated the norm and maybe they'll punish you if you don't punish it or they'll reward you for, for, for punishing the norm violation. So th- there's an essential need to, to, to coordinate with people on, on, on norm violations on what counts as a non-violation. Um, that's one uh, of several settings that we talk about that, that involve an element of coordination. And whenever an element of coordination com- comes into play, all sorts of interesting counterintuitive effects come into play too. Like, it's very, very hard to coordinate on uh, continuous variables, much easier to coordinate on, on mm-hmm. categorical distinctions. So if we want to have a norm that says um, uh, you can't wantonly, um, you know, kill civilians well you know it's maybe somewhat easy to enforce that if you can you know have go from zero civilians to to, to one but it's, it's much harder to say okay well 50 people or uh, you mm-hmm. know five percent of your population you know it, it's it would be very very hard for us to agree on exactly when that norm is violated so the zero to one point it, that's somewhat easy to agree on and and the type of weapon is easy to agree on because mm-hmm. those are both discrete differences and so, so we kind of argue a lot of our norms have this feature that they, they, they treat zero very different from one. They treat categories like types of weapon very different. And, and that's, that, that's a result of the need to coordinate. Um, and, and the need to coordinate kind of is therefore going to lead to things that are kind of second best. Like we might want a norm that says, you know, well, you know, um, uh, there's a utilitarian outcome. Well, you, mm-hmm. utilitarian, you know, that's, that's, that's very continuous. You know, you have trade-offs and, you know, we end up with norms instead that are very categorical. You can never torture no matter how much the benefits. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's, that's one, one implication of the need to, to coordinate. And, um, you know, there's going to be a relation between that and common knowledge and plausible deniability and all sorts of other puzzling behaviors that we bring up and that maybe your econ audience have, have heard about. Well, I was doing a podcast recently with uh, a biologist who was describing that um, even fish, when they're fighting over territory, if if you if you lay down a bunch of cans or something, you know, between their uh, their 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 home bases, then the conflict gets substantially reduced because there's a salient mm. boundary. But when there's no, you know, when it's just pure sand and there's no clear kind of you know, line that they can, you know, fixate on, then they, they wind up fighting a whole lot more, which I, I, found, I found was amazing. You can pretty much create a peace between these fish just by laying a bunch of cans down, um, you know, somewhere between their territories. It doesn't even have to be 50-50. It could be, you know, 60-40, 70-30, but wherever that, you know, that, that artificial object is, it, it allows for, you know, for better coordination. Yeah, that, that's a good example for us. We're going to pick it up. Well, so you talk about, okay, so there's good norms and bad norms, right? So you talk about racism, right? That's, a, that's a, obviously a, a bad norm. Um, and, and you can use some of the same, you have, you have a toolbox for, you know, helping to strengthen norms and, uh, and also to kind of disrupt norms. And, and I love this story because in, you know, in, in, in competition theory, right, we're always thinking, okay, how do we, you know, break up um, collusion, right, when, they're, when companies are trying to fix prices, but then we're also, okay, how do we facilitate cooperation among industry players if we're trying to get them to, say, invest in, in, in research? Okay, and so a lot of, you know, antitrust law and so forth is, is about, you know, tweaking, tweaking those incentives to disrupt or facilitate um, cooperation or coordination. So could, could you talk a bit about, you know, what are some of the mechanisms that you can use to, to kind of jumpstart norms? Um, I know in the behavioral law and economics literature, they, they talk about how you know, the, the law can often drive norms, right? So, you know, you have a seatbelt law or, you know, pick up the poop law and all of a sudden, you know, everybody starts, you know, chastising their neighbors. Um, but then in other cases, right, it's, it's the norm that drives the law. But, but the idea is that you can use something like law. But, but if you don't have that tool at, available, what are some of the other things you can do to kind of strengthen or weaken norms? We usually talk about three sets of tools. Um, one is uh, if you want to promote a norm, you want to increase observability of, of the behavior you're trying to encourage, um, make it so that other people can find out so that they can chastise or reward. Uh, the second would be uh, to uh, uh, decrease the amount of plausible excuses people have. 
So if you're asking people to engage in a behavior and they have lots of excuses available, then it makes it harder for people to punish or chastise um, because, you know, they might not be viewed as punishing or chastising when they should and they might be themselves concerned about looking like jerks. And then the third is to, to um, basically set expectations. So if you're going to... to um, recruit the aid of a bunch of third-party punishers, then what you want is to kind of get everybody on board with the fact that this is something that is going to be uh, third-party punished. And so to some extent, what you're doing is not just announcing to individuals, hey, you should be doing this behavior. You're announcing to the people around them, hey, you should punish people who don't engage in the behavior. And you do that kind of in public to get everybody on board at once. Um, so those are the three categories of things we look at. And, and you could then think about the uh, doing the opposite when it comes to disrupting bad norms like um, uh, racism, where you would want to, try, or, or to disrupt things like collusion, where you would, uh, you know, economists do talk about the fact that posted prices make it easier to collude because they yeah. make it very observable uh, whether somebody has cooperated or not. And they talk about disrupting collusion by uh, um, messing with the mechanism by which they post prices. Uh, but we also talk about things like introducing plausible excuses and, um, and you know, doing things like messing with expectations, uh, you know, making public announcements that could screw up uh, uh, the expectations of the folks who are uh, trying to cooperate in this uh, uh, antisocial way. So this also is, is true in so the employment setting, right? So in, in labor economics, you know, we talk about how I employees can kind of collude to reduce uh, productivity, right? And That's so, right. you know, to that extent, you know, even if you offer peace rates, it's it's not going to really work if they're working so, kind of side by side. That's and, right. And this so the great example from, I think it's uh, Baron Kay et al., that uh, looked at fruit pickers and found that they were able to uh, collude when the fruit was low, but not so able to, to collude when the fruit was high. And so they worked real hard in order to earn the pe uh, peace rate because they couldn't see each other in these higher, taller bushes. But when they could see each other, everybody, like, uh, they did a race to the, they enforced a, a, mm -hmm. a you know, take it easy kind of norm. Mm -hmm. Now I, w I want to turn to virtue signaling, right? So I, I don't did you I don't know if you actually use that that term, but obviously it's a term that is, you know, uh, in 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 popular discourse uh, quite quite a bit. And um, you know, I was I was at the um, I was at the theater last night here in Berkeley, and and here in Berkeley, I, I don't know if we're the only place in the world um, outside of China where everyone wears masks to. Um, you know, to the opera and to the symphony and, and, and to, to the theater. Um, but, but, you know, I was with a, a friend of mine who was like, this is, who's not from here. It's like, this is, this is, this is kind of crazy. And I was like, look, it's, if you, you know, if you, if you go to a synagogue, you know, you, you put a yarmulke on and, and you don't question the functionality of the, of, of the yarmulke. You just understand that that's, you know, that's just what you do, right. Out of respect for, for where you are, and so when you know, when you come to to Berkeley, you know you just you just just put put your mask on and and don't 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 think about it too much, right? Because I mean, I think at this point, it it doesn't serve a whole lot of, uh, um, you know, it, public health uh, objectives. I mean, is is so? Could you tell? I mean, when when you, I think it, it requires a little bit of a flip, uh, when, you know, because I guess people are much more sensitive to something that is serving the purpose of virtue signaling in, in their home home environment as opposed to, uh, particularly if you have this emic way of, of looking at things. You got this one? I mean, I, I, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you could ask in general, where does our morality come from and, and, and our norm compliant behaviors and you know at some level it's it, it's selfish in the sense that you know everything has to evolve or be learned and so so presumably there's something uh, uh, you know we're, we're, we don't believe that there's like you know fundamental moral truths that we discover through like wisdom or something like speak for yourself yeah <laughs> um, so like all of our morality in some in some sense has to come from like social enforcement and, and social mm -hmm. signaling and these kind of things and so then in what sense is, is virtue signaling unique and I'm guessing what people usually mean by that is well it's it's something that you're you're doing very consciously so, you know, uh, you, you haven't fully internalized it and you're not going to be principled about it. You're only kind of doing it because you're consciously thinking through this will make me look good. And that, mm -hmm. that particularly feels dirty. Um, yeah. Uh, and they also, to some extent, mean cases where 
it seems like the benefit accrue primarily to you and not to society. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, when you, when you engage in, in third party punishment of a bad behavior, often, you know, making it so that other people engage in, in behaviors that are pro-social. Originally, when we third party punished people who didn't wear masks, that came from a desire to try to stop COVID from spreading when we didn't mm. have vaccines and so on. And so it does serve a social function. But then, you know, now it seems like to some extent, it's been co-opted for people to show off a certain set of values or group mm -hmm. membership or something like and, that. And to the extent that you are, you're, you're aware that it's no longer serving that purpose, or you should be aware, it's kind of obvious that, like, well, the only reason you could be doing this is because you're just trying to look good. Like, to the extent that people are conscious of that, and like, it just seems so unreasonable otherwise, or so disproportionate, or so obviously not serving uh, the greater good, then I think we start to, to um. To think about that very very differently and, and we do have a model i don't think we got to it in this book but we, we have a model where we kind of talk about when people are kind of moral but for but for the very con deliberate about why they're being moral they're, they're kind of thinking through all oh, this will give me reputational benefits um even if uh, at the bottom bottom of the day whether you think through it or not it's got to be sustained in equilibrium it's got to be somehow incentivized when you think through it that kind of allows you to kind of adjust your behavior in a more circumstantial way, and, and that makes you less trustworthy in general. And so, so we kind of have this like general story about like behavior that's more principled versus behavior that's more consciously, deliberatively uh, um, uh, uh, doing good. We tend to think of the latter as, as much much less principled and, and much less um, reliable. And, and so I think that's part of what people are picking on when they say, "Oh, you're just virtue signaling." It's, "Oh, you're doing this too consciously." Um, yeah. Well, um, you know, you have some. Uh, stuff in the book about charity and how people engage in charitable behavior and and it's it's kind of disappointing because it it seems like people aren't really concerned with the outcomes or the impact of their charitable behavior right and um and and so I remember I was um had a, a relative who um was uh, soliciting some funds for a uh uh, a charitable cause, and, and I did a little research and, and discovered that this charitable cause was um, pretty ineffective. <laughs> you know, it didn't didn't really do anything. It was, uh, I, I, you know, I think there's a there's a place you can go and find out how much of the funds raised go towards administration, and I think 100 percent of this went towards administration. And so I, I I discussed with her. I said, hey, you know, this thing doesn't really do anything. And she said, well, of course it does. I mean, it makes all of us, you know, feel more charitable. <laughs> And, and I thought, wow, that, that's that's a very sophisticated view of things, right? But um, but 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 you know, this this raises even bigger questions because in the you know in the Bible they say you know don't let the left hand know what the right hand is is doing, and so you're you know you're supposed to um, do charity in a way that you know you're not showing it off to other people, but you know you know that you're doing it. And so you're you're in in some way, you know, signaling to yourself that that you're charitable. I mean, is there a way that you can? I mean, is there a way that you can you can design a charity strategy that is that is impactful, um, that is not in some way motivated by some strategic purpose? Yes and no. I mean, I think the fact that it's strategic in and of itself does not make it so that you can't make it um, uh, impactful. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, I would start by kind of separating out. There's there's sort of two questions on the table. One is when people are giving, are they giving kind of for the quote right reasons? Um, and you know, if they're not giving for the quote right reasons, is that a problem? And the other one is. Regardless of why they're giving, people seem to be terrible at giving if you measure them based on the impact they're having. Um, and um, I think that, that uh, I would sort of tackle those somewhat separately. Um, so I'll start with, with the, um, the impact thing. So, so Mo mentioned earlier, we have this model that says we can't really coordinate so effectively when it comes to uh, continuous variables. And here we are with another uh, uh, continuous variable impact. Some mm -hmm. charities are, the, their impact is very high, some, some lower, some, some basically close to zero. It's, it's a continuous variable. There we go. We have a pretty difficult situation on our hands in terms of coordinating to, to norm and force so that people only give to the most impactful charities. So what we're going to need to do is to somehow uh, coordinate on something else. GiveWell, the charity uh, evaluator, has 
have given us a model of how one might try to do that. Um, the effect of altruists are not currently um, in vogue, um, thanks to the behavior of the FTX founder, but um, GiveWell, um, I still think is a good example of how one can potentially get around this. Basically, there are certain certifications that we could coordinate on, and if something hits that certification, great. And if it doesn't, then we don't give to it. And we could only reward people for giving to charities that have received that certification. And as long as we, we think that those certifications are doing something fairly meaningful, then that would improve the um, uh, impact that we would be having. Now, it would, it would be imperfect. Uh, GiveWell has certain decisions it has to make when assessing the impact of a charity, and uh, other people might disagree over whether they, you know, some things should count and some things shouldn't count, mm -hmm. and exactly how one counts them and so on. Uh, but at least it would probably, uh, on average, improve. And notice, in general, anytime you kind of go from continuous to categorical, you lose a little information mm -hmm. uh, in in the way that that in, in ways like the ones that we just described. It's somewhat less efficient. That's what economists refer to as second best instead of first best. Um, so that's uh, that's how one might try to tackle the Im impact thing, and hopefully we'll move in that direction. Uh, in terms of, of deliberation, there's there's a question of you know to some extent there's a cost when people uh, are less deliberate when they give. And, and give kind of for the wrong reasons, um, sorry, and, are, and but are only giving kind of for the right reasons emotionally and stuff, then on the one hand, they tend to be more trustworthy, they tend to be more willing to give under more circumstances and things like that. But on the other hand, they tend to give to places that are less impactful. So there's kind of this like yeah. give and take that's going on there, a pro and a con. And so there you kind of have to balance the two. And, and I think people have this intuition when it comes to effective altruism in particular. They kind of vilify effective altruists. And, and they have the sense that they're giving, but like in this way that makes them jerks. Um, and and I, I think that if you try to force everybody to constantly give in, in very particular ways that they don't find intuitive to charities that they don't find, but don't help them, uh, you know, build up a, a reputation that they care about, that don't help them show off certain sets of values that they, they want to show off, you're just going to cut them out of charity entirely. And it's not clear to me which is better, having them give, but to ineffective charities or not give to effective charities. Well, you know, in, in the back of the symphony uh, program, right, we have a list of all the donors and, and the, you know, the more you donate, the bigger your, you know, your name is in the, in the back. Um, I'm wondering if, if, you know, should we, should we think about having like Nobel prizes for charitable impact, right? Um, where we have some measure of, of impact and we, you know, Put the put the big names up there based on impact. I think that'd be a really good kind of thing. Um, again, it's imperfect. Somebody's got to decide how uh, how we're going to measure impact, and they're going to do it mm -hmm. imperfectly. But but I think that that's better than what we've got right now. Mm -hmm. Well, so you you also talk in, in some of the um, in some of the trust games, right? How you can make small tweaks in uh, the the words that you use and elicit very different behaviors right so if you use the word you know take versus steal so you know i i think a standard model would say look everyone understands what's going on here but by by changing the name i mean of what it is that you're doing you're 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 sort of signaling to the participants in the experiment sort of how what they're doing is is being viewed is that, is that by the experimenter or is it sort of um just just sort of triggering some you know, moral intuition when you change the wording. We kind of hope it's the latter in that, like, if they're, if they're really uh, trying to game it for us, that's not really the point of the experiment. The point of the experiment is to try to get at their intuitions from outside of this experiment and understand those better. And so we're kind of hoping that what we're doing is triggering some, some in intuition that these words have and then causing that to spill over into the lab. And so the, the lesson is trying to teach us uh, what, uh, what we're trying to learn from this experiment is that people's uh, altruistic sentiments, how much they're willing to give in like a dictator game, is uh, a spillover effect. It, it, it's really shaped by, by the outside of the lab environment that tends to be where norms get enforced, where you can build up a reputation. And, and uh, in those kind of settings, what the norm is really matters and how things are framed very much tells you mm -hmm. what the norm is. 
And so, so that's what we're trying to, how we interpret these experiments is they're telling you, oh, look, people are willing to give a lot more when it's framed this way versus that way. That suggests that our sense of giving is really being shaped by the outside world where norms get enforced mm -hmm. and, and framing effects, you know, gives valuable information what the norms are and what will be enforced. Um, and so you also have some interesting stuff on, on apologies, right? So, you know, what, what, is, what, are, what are apologies for? I mean, it seems like cheap talk, right? I mean, how, how, how difficult is it? I mean, if someone says, hey, you know, if you say you're sorry, then you'll get all these, these you know, these, these, these benefits. Why would anybody refuse to say I'm sorry? I mean, it seems like, it seems like a, 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 free, a free pass, so to speak. So, I mean, I think uh, Michael Schrey is uh, an economist who's made a, a similar point, which is that um, in uh, coordination settings where, you know, in games with multiple equilibria, um, uh, cheap talk, specifically when the cheap talk has specific features, like it generates common knowledge, it's, it's, it's very explicit, uh, there's no plausible deniability, um, uh, everybody agrees on, on, on whether this specific phrase was uttered, can affect which equilibria we, we, we expect to be played. Um, and so what an apology is doing, in essence, is we interpret it as it's kind of setting future expectations in a way that's self-fulfilling that, look, I'm not going to uh, play hawk in this kind of situation mm. in the future. I'm going to play dove. You're going to play hawk. And you'll expect, you know, in a hawk-dove game, you know, there's multiple, two equilibria, one where I play dove, you play hawk, one where you play dove, and I play hawk. Uh, it, uh, you know, those, those equilibria are, are self-fulfilling. If we both expect me to play dove, I'm better off actually playing dove. And so an apology is, is just kind of a way for, for us to, to coordinate on you're going to play hawk in the future. And you might induce me to apologize. You know, you might tell me, look, if you don't apologize, I'll, I'll punish you. And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I... I yeah, and so so that's the idea. If I've misbehaved in a way that, that I want to kind of reset the equilibria so that I play mm -hmm. Dove, that's going to be costly to me, so I might refuse to apologize, even though it's just cheap talk. You know, I might not want to do it because I, I want to play Hawk in the future. Um, but yeah, cheap talk, when it's when it generates common knowledge, can matter in, in situations like the Hawk Dove game. So, look, I think, you know, when it comes to, if you're, if you're designing kind of a, a model of constrained optimization and you're trying to explain these behaviors, which, I, you know, traditional economists would view as as irrational i mean it, it seems like there's 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 two ways you could go about it i mean one is that you could emphasize um the, the constraints right so you could have sort of a herb simon view which says you know people have limitations on their cognition and they're lazy and so you know we're gonna come up with some crude rules and these crude rules are, are gonna get it wrong a bunch of times right and that, that would be kind of i guess the more kahneman tversky view of quote, irrational behavior. But then, you know, there's a whole different approach, which is to dig deeper and figure out, you know, what is the, the, the functionality? And, and it de-emphasizes kind of the, 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 the crudeness of, our, of our, our reasoning. And it actually emphasizes kind of the subtlety and, and sophistication of our, our reasoning. Um, and I see you guys sort of in that second camp. I mean, do you see that view kind of displacing a lot of what behavioral economics has been doing, um, you know, by, by emphasizing the, the more, I guess, in, environmental rationality or ecological rationality of, of, of all these behaviors that we, we, we see as contrary to the, you know, neoclassical model? You want to do the politically correct one and I'll do the real one? Or is that <laughs> um, I, think, I, I think the answer is we'd like for at least people to question whether when they see something that seems irrational, they have simply failed to understand the reason it's there mm -hmm. because they're thinking about it in the wrong way. You know, maybe they're, they're analyzing it at the wrong level. Um, sometimes the answer is that cognition is, you know, limited in some way or, you yes. know, there's these blunt tools as you're describing. But, but I think that there is a tendency to run towards that explanation um, any time there's not an obvious explanation for for the behavioral quirk, and part of what we hope this book convinces people is that, um, and you know, we're far from the only people kind of um, on that side of the argument, uh, but but you know, we're hoping this contributes to that side of the argument is that sometimes it's just a matter of thinking a little bit harder, and then and there is an underlying logic to the behavior. Well, I mean, it, you can't study biology and not have, you know, an inclination towards that latter approach, right? Because you know, when you study biology, you know, there's, you know, when there's 
hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, right? I mean, you know, you have enough time to develop fair, fairly sophisticated rules, right? And, and so, you know, with, with culture, you can develop ones that are even more sophisticated. So I, I think that, you know, limit, limited cognition should be sort of a, a, a last resort when it comes to finding an explanation, right? We're not going to, you're not going to get any argument here. Well, I mean, did, did both of you, did studying biology in, in some way help you to, you know, push you a little bit yeah. more in that, that direction? Yeah, I mean, you, do you think we should? Do you think we should make economists, you know, take a take a little course? I used to teach a course on economics and biology, um, you know, like twenty five years ago. But I, I, you don't you, t you don't tend to see that in the economics curriculum. I, I think that there's we're drawing inspiration from folks who sat down and said, "Wait a minute, like we don't have a theory right now, and we need a theory." And like, what is what? What should constrain the kinds of answers we should be giving? What what kind of framework should be we be using most of the time? Um, you know, D Darwin, of course, being the giant name in the room, but not the only one. Um, and, and yeah, I think I think that we would like to see more thinking along those lines. And I think that this is a, you know a, a theory of science question. It's one, especially I think Mo thinks about more. I don't know why I'm doing all the talking here, but um, <laughs> I, I think I think that it's, you know, what counts as a good way to come up with a theory um, is something that, that I think he's sort of challenging himself on every day and, and, and uh, examining amongst others. And, and I think it, there is some inspiration from biology that's, uh, that's uh, uh, at play here, yeah? I mean, but biologists do force us a lot to think through different levels of analysis, and including bringing things back to function and why things evolved. And, and yeah, I, I think economists and JDM and social psychologists could, could use more of that kind of grounding where it's okay to talk about things at approximate level, at a psychological level, but, but you should be forced to answer how that might be learned or evolved and, and, and do that extra step. And when you do that, you might notice that there's some, some holes in your argument or, or some further questions that need to be asked and you might gain some extra insight for, from doing that. Yeah, it always seemed puzzling to me that um, psychologists, whenever they spot something, they they, they come up with uh, what what they call a theory, right? And they say, "Oh, this is the, you know, the so and so theory," which now all of a sudden ex explains a whole bunch of stuff. But the, the the theory itself doesn't have you know a theory to explain the theory, right? So you know, where does one? I mean, is there is there an ultimate stopping point when you're trying to figure out like you know where you 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 draw the line in terms of causal explanation? I, I mean, I like to use the, the phrase grounding. I don't, I don't know if there's a better word in the philosophy of science literature, but, but um, you, you want to bring back your arguments to something that's well understood and, and to, to, mm -hmm. to things, you know, so if you bring something back to like how it's learned or how it's evolved when it comes to, uh, um, you know, our psychology, that, that makes sense because we, we know how evolution works. We know how learning processes work. But when you just say like, this makes us feel good, um, uh, like that, Okay, but like, why does that make us feel good? When does that make us right. feel good? You haven't like, grounded like, ter it. like terror management theory. You know, you hear something like that, and you're like, okay, yeah. well, that that definitely you know describes what what we're seeing. I'm not sure if it explains it. Right, exactly. So it's going to beg as many questions as it answers. It's not really going to going to tell you, um, uh, you know, when you'll get this effect, or, or um, it won't give you that deep of an understanding of, of what's going on. But but if you bring things back to to, to a solid foundation. Um, uh, yeah. Sometimes the way I think of it, I don't know, I don't know if this is something that's that useful, but sometimes the way I think of it is if you can take the word theory and replace it with strategy, mm -hmm. then that's probably the right way to think of it for some of these papers. Oh, this is a terror management strategy. Got it. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and do you think that, you know, I, I teach strategy, so I spend a lot of time teaching business people, right, who are going out into the world, you know, to do things. Do, do you think that, you know, what you are um, doing is providing people with, I guess, you know, a toolbox of strategies that, that, that they can use? I mean, you know, how, how, how much do you view what you're doing as explanatory and how much do you view what you're doing as, as pragmatic? 90% in the former camp, 10% in the last camp. I, like, mm -hmm. I think that when you understand things better, 
then you know there is some pragmatic uh, influence of that. Often, in order to to really um, have a pragmatic impact, you have to do one more set of you kind of kind of have to work a little bit harder. You have to draw the connection for people. Uh, so, for instance, we could talk about how norm enforcement works, and people might get some. Uh, pragmatic takeaways from that, but often it helps for us to draw them out further. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, when we were talking earlier about observability, plausible deniability, and expectations, that was kind of on us to, to look at the equilibria conditions um, that we were encountering and uh, say, okay, these are kind of the key features that enable for cooperation to arise in these kinds of settings, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, here's a translation of what these equilibrium conditions mean. Because if you just kind of stick to the analysis, you have words like third party punishment and higher order punishment and, and you know, multiple equilibria, which don't translate into, okay, but what do I do with that? Uh, whereas observability, plausible deniability, expectations do. I think. When it comes to some of the other models in in the book, almost all of them would have pragmatic takeaways if one did the work to, to really mm -hmm. draw out those pragmatic takeaways. I think we've done less work um, in those other domains, uh, and there's more work to be done. Um, and therefore, I, I think the fair thing to say is we primarily focused in this book on explaining, and here and there, there will be a pragmatic takeaway, um, but that's not the primary focus. Mm -hmm. Well, Arez, Mo, Thank you so much for joining me. The, uh, we barely scratched the surface of this very, very rich book, which, um, you know, if you're interested in learning a little bit about aesthetics, if you want to, you know, start a cult, <laughs> if you want to uh, do some uh, norm enforcement uh, or norm disruption, uh, there are some super, super useful. I know you de-emphasize the practical, but there's plenty of practical insights here in the book. And I don't think you can kind of look at the, the world uh, the same way after you check it out. Hidden Games. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having us. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.